Jared Stockton, welcome to Overtime. It's been a long time. What's up, brother? Good to hear from you, man. All good? All is well, man. All is well over here. How's life? How's basketball? Uh, everything's good on this end, man. Um, I recently just got back from Mexico. Um, it was a good experience. I just got back to the States, man. I've been spending time with the family and just staying in shape. Where are you playing right now? Where are you training? Uh, right now, I'm training in Scottsdale, man, Paradise Valley. You know, a lot of professionals come out here and, and, uh, and work out. You know, we have the best weather. So um, we all go to the facility. We go to Paradise Valley uh, Prep School and um, and play pickup games. And and also, there's a <clears throat> there's an academy here called League Me where I, I attend sometimes and play against the younger guys that's coming out of college going pro. So it's a good competition. NBA players? Yeah, a lot of ex-NBA players, you know, guys like Mark Stoudemire, J.R. Ryder, um, Shannon Fry, you know, Mike Baby, stuff like that. And Mike Baby's a good friend of mine, you know. So Mike's still playing? Huh? Mike's still playing at this age? Yeah, every, every the game is always being played, bro, from a young age all the way to old age. You, you'll be surprised how many people do not stop playing basketball. <laughs> they, they stop the business of basketball. You know, it's it's a basketball's draining when you become a professional. They just do it for fun. Playing for fun is how we all started, and that's the best way to play. You know. Terrell, uh, let's dig deep into the Lebanese league. Let's start with your last season with uh, Sajas. First of all, uh, you're still a fan favorite. Fans always ask for you to come back. Fans always ask the manager to bring us Terrell back. So man, uh, you still remember it here. Yeah, man. Honestly, uh, the people suggest is in my heart, and not just the people suggest, the Lebanese people as a whole is in my heart, man. And um, my son was born out there. You know, he was born in Biblos. And um, the people took care of us while I was out there. I was with my wife at the time, my son. We had a good time, man. You guys treated me like family. And um, I put my blood, sweat, and tears for that green blood for suggest, you know, that green castle. You know what I mean? So for them to still want me back and, and still remember me, you know, a lot of a lot of players go and play in Lebanon. A lot of good players, top talent. And for them to still say my name and still chant me, it means a lot to me, you know. <clears throat> Tarel, why did you leave Sajas for good for the final time? Man, um, you know, when you talk to me, you're always going to get honesty. You know what I mean? And um, the main reason why I left Sajas is because I missed out on a lot of opportunities making more money than I was being offered. And um, I also haven't returned because I see that they offer people more money than they offer me. You know what I mean? So I had to make the best decision for my family, you know, and, and go elsewhere. So I went to Africa. What are the deals that uh, you, lo you, you missed on uh, while being in Sajal? Yeah, well, I mean, you're Lebanese, man. You know how Lebanese people are sometimes, you know. They make a lot of empty promises. You know what I mean? And um, I'm not going to throw any names out there, but I was in certain situations where I went to go play in a tournament in Dubai, and I was struggling financially. And the coach that was coaching Suggest at the time had knew that I was struggling financially. And um, he offered me a little bit amount of money. I took it. And um, I had reality. They asked to, to buy me out for me to play with them for the rest of the season. And they were offering me over $25,000 a month. And um, so just wouldn't let me go. They said that they didn't want me to play for their rival and the people wouldn't accept that. And so I was left in the dust, you know what I mean? And, you know, a lot of things go on under the ground than a lot of fans know. It's not just basketball, you know, or, or self-discipline or acting right or, you're dealing with people who aren't held accountable for their actions as well. You know what I'm saying? No one's ever hold coaches or, or general managers, you know, responsible too often. It's always a player, you know what I mean? So it's part of business. Terrell, how close were you to joining a team in China? Well, I played in China. I went. To, I, I played in the NBL, you know, the, the second division, the summer league. You know, I went over there. They, played, they paid a good amount of money. Um, they took care of me, and I went to the finals. Had a couple. I had a sixty-point triple double out there. You know what I mean. I had some great games. Um, actually, I had a deal for one point three million dollars coming out of China, and I had, you know, an administrator that works for Suggest. You know, 
reached out to the China team and told them that um, pretty much how to blackball me. Said that I was starting fights with teammates when I, that was never true. They just wanted me to stay for that year and they didn't want me to leave. So I had a little resentment in my heart towards uh, certain, you know, organizations. Can we say to certain people in the organization, not actually the organization, because suggest as a club and as a fan, suggest as a club, it's all about it's all about their fans. Their fans are the the blood of the the team. They're the heart of the team. They're the soul of the team. People right. come, people go. Management come, management go. Players come, coaches leave. The fans, the only thing that's stable in this club. Yeah. Um. So let me clarify. When I say organization. I mean the ones who make the decision for that club. So like the fans don't make the decisions. You know what I'm saying? The organization does, you know. I saw the fans ask for me back this year. You know, I seen it on podcasts. You know, I seen people, you know, make uh Facebook posts and they want me back, but I saw the administration not offer me or reach out not once. And I seen them offer other guys double the amount that they ever thought about offering me. You know, I never made over twenty thousand dollars playing for Suggest in the times that I was uh, playing with them. You know, I never signed for over twenty thousand dollars a month. You know, and now they got guys that signing for forty, fifty, thirty. You know, and I don't get a phone call. So I, uh, I'm talking about the administration. You know what I mean? The fans live in my heart. You know what I'm saying? But but Terrell, don't you think the background of your career, the CV, if you want to call it. Like the players that are getting paid 40 and 30 and 50K, they're ex-NBA players. They're mainly NBA experience. They're mainly EuroLeague. Uh, they they're, they already have this kind of experience. While you came at a young age, so that you were at like 22 or 23. You didn't have this experience yet. Don't you think um, this is another reason why you got a lower salary than other people? Um, I wouldn't say that because Coach Foa got me from EuroLeague. You know what I'm saying? That's when I came to suggest. I was in EuroLeague. I played for Zelona Gora, you know, and I had a three-year deal there. And Coach Foa reached out to me because he wanted me to come. And not only that, I was in negotiations with another EuroLeague team called Vereze. They were EuroLeague at the time in Italy, and they offered me a two-year deal, you know, and I was there for nine months. And so Foa knew about me, and he asked me if I wanted to try out the Middle East. So I already had that tag on me. Plus, I was with the Raptors, the summer league before that. You know what I mean? And um, so I'm not comparing myself to anybody. I'm not saying this person should make that type of money. I would never say that. That's their business. That's their career. That's their path. You understand what I'm saying is, you know, you can't come to me and say I'm a legend and offer me $5,000. <laughs> you know? Did, I, uh, did you get any offers after leaving Sajas from Lebanon from any other team? Yeah, and, and that what brings the point. You know, I don't want to say any names. I don't want to say any teams, but I've got offers from Lebanon. The the fans want me. The fans petition for me, but the administration will come and offer me six thousand dollars. And when I know that the guy that they offered twenty five thousand dollars, he called me to ask me like, how is that place? Because you're the king over there. How is it over there? You know, and I, I'm like, how much they get? They are, and he tells me. I mean, you know, I talk to the team, they say they have budget crisis, they don't have the money. So just little things like that. I'm not upset about it. I'm just, I'm not bitter about it. It's just the truth of the situation. And that's why I left Lebanon. You asked why I left. I said it was a financial reason why I left. When I went to Africa, I didn't have to deal with type of stuff like that. Why didn't we see you in the NBA? Um, there's a number of reasons. Um, I got blackballed from the NBA in the year 2012. I rubbed a few people that are high status the wrong way because I'm not going to say how real I am, but I'm a no nonsense guy. If I see something that's um, not genuine, I speak about it. Um, and everything that I do is um, attributed to that. Everything that I stand for is attributed to that. So you don't get to go certain places. You don't get things that supposedly you deserve. Um, and I'm okay with that. There's a consequence to certain things. There's a consequence to serving certain pe certain gods as well. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's real. You know, I can say from my own experience, that's real. You know, a lot of things just ran through uh, committees and, um, and groups. If you rub somebody wrong, the wrong way that's in a certain group that makes decisions, then you're not going to get certain opportunities. Because at the end of the day, we're a dime a dozen. 
<laughs> we're just athletes, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. they can go get another guy that can shoot three. They can go get another guy that can, you know, as long as that person doesn't make them feel uncomfortable while they do dirt, you know? See, uh, some people say that you're a selfish uh, player on court and you you just go for scoring. You don't play defense. You don't grab your rebounds. You don't give out dimes. You just score. Mm -hmm. But these same people don't know that some coaches ask you to do this. They ask you to be selfish. Can mm -hmm. you explain more about this topic, and ex especially in Lebanon, how it occurred with your time at Lebanon? Yeah, I mean, me, to be completely honest with you, like, it would be impossible for me to be um, respected or even talked about as much as I have, um, even to keep certain jobs and have the resume that I have if I was just a one-dimensional basketball player. You know, I won a state championship in high school. You know what I'm saying? Um, I got more than five championships as a pro. You know, I left Lebanon and won two championships in Morocco. I won a championship in Egypt and got MVP for a team called Zamalek, who ended up winning the BAL the best team in Africa, that was my team, you know. And when I got there, they hadn't been to the championship in 12 years. So, you know, with my help, we won the championship and I got MVP. Um, I went to the, the finals in South America, game seven. Um, I went to the finals in China. Um, I went to the finals in Bahrain. You know, I, I, I set records and I play for championships. The people who say that I don't, they just nitpick my game which is okay because they do it to all the greats. You know, they worship people for scoring, but when I score, that's all I do. I just left the BAL averaging 30 points a game, five rebounds and five assists for two years in a row. What does that mean? You know what I'm saying? So, like, I, I don't really pay attention to that. And not only did I, did I do that, but my team went to the playoffs each round. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I don't really pay too much attention to what people say because I don't live for people. You know what I'm saying? Um, I believe I have a, a bigger following of people who understand what I stand for and have a heart for what I do. You know. In Lebanon, were you sometimes uh, asked to score 35? Then you're gonna score 40. Then you're gonna score 30. Were yeah, yeah, it? yeah. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, if we're gonna be real, the game of basketball is putting the ball into the hoop. You know what I'm saying? It's like. How are you going to hire Carmelo Anthony to come to your team and then say that he's just a scorer? I mean, that's his job to score. How are you going to hire Allen Iverson to come to your team when he's a scorer? He's a scorer. Michael Jordan, he's a scorer. Like, how are you going to tell me that I'm just a scorer? That's my job. Teams hire me when they need a score. You know what I'm saying? So I don't understand that. Um, I never played in a game where a guy put 30 points on me. I never played in a game where a guy went and dunked on me or crossed me up. I never had that situation. So. Um, I, since I, you opened that topic, since you opened that topic, many yes. coaches in Lebanon uh, used to say that having Terrell on your team, it's a liability on defense. You have to play zone. You can't man up. He's lazy on defense. Uh, he can't pick up his man. He's undersized. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, you, are you, you asking me what I think about that? Yeah. I mean, I really don't pay too much attention to it. You know what I'm saying? Um, I just gave you my resume. You know what I'm saying? I played for championships. I've been a winner since I was little. You know what I'm saying? I've been doing this. I was a college star. We won games. I won a state championship in high school, set scoring record here for the state of Arizona. I've been doing this for so long. You know, um, you're not great unless you have critics. I mean, they still criticizing Jordan to this day. They still criticizing Luka Doncic to this day. They say he don't play defense, which do go out there and kill everybody. The fact of the matter is when I'm on the court, it brings fear. You know what I'm saying? When I'm on the court, people know they got to watch out and I, I put pressure on the defense. There's certain coaches that can deal with that. And then you got to understand, like there's certain coaches who, who are uncomfortable around certain people. You know, it's easy to make excuses for certain situations when you're uncomfortable. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm a personality that everyone's not comfortable around. You know what I mean? So when you look at me and I'm, I'm killing you try to make an excuse for why I'm killing. But everywhere I go, I'm killing and I'm winning. So, like, I, I don't pay attention to it. They say I'm not a winner, but I went right to Africa after Lebanon and won a championship in Egypt. That's the hardest league. That's a harder league than Lebanon. Egyptian basketball is at the top. <laughs> I went with a team that had no experience, and we won that together. 
You know what I'm saying? Team player. You know what I'm saying? Average 34 a game, and we won that. I left there, went to Morocco, won two championships in a row, which brought us into the BAL. Went to the BAL, averaged 30 points a game for two years, shot over 50%, and averaged five rebounds and five assists a game. That's just a guy that's just ultra talented. He's blessed. God is with him. And um, if God is for me, I don't care who's against me. And that's what keeps me strong, you know, the kingdom of God. You know what I'm Today's- saying? Like, like I, I got to get this off my chest. Like, what keeps me the way I am isn't arrogance or anything like that. It's more of understanding the situations that I'm in and understanding what's supposed to happen for those who are called according to God's purpose. You know, you talk about violence. Look, 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 let me say this though. The Bible says that if the world loves you, then the love of the Father's not in you. So I've been in many situations where my stats, my resume has been undeniable. But because what I stand for, who I am, and how I talk and how I conduct myself, um, it brings persecution. You understand? I had to let that be known because I'm not the only one that gets persecuted. I'm not trying to say I'm a victim. I'm not trying to say, oh, everyone did Terrell Stokeland dirty. I'm not innocent. What I'm saying is they're always going to be talking about me, no matter what I do. I just gave you a resume of what I did. And for some reason, it's looked over. You know what I'm saying? They can say all that. But if you say, oh, he just won a championship in, in Africa, why do they ignore that? You know, I left Lebanon, what, six years ago, seven years ago? Look what I've accomplished outside of that. I've won three championships. I've been the face of African basketball for the last two and a half years. Um, you can't talk on me. And the things that they try to talk about is things that I do off the court, which is none of their business. I'm a grown man. I do what I want as long as I produce on the court. I do my job to perfection. That's what I want to ask you. Uh, in parallel to talent, okay, in basketball, there's hard work, there's dedication, there's practice, there's putting time into it off the court, before the games, into team practices, personal practices. Mm-hmm. You had, you definitely had the talent. One of the most talented people that ever stepped foot in Lebanon. Sometimes you made it look so easy on court, while well, it's so hard, actually. But do you think that uh, some disciplinary issues, some off-court issues, some lack of practice, lack of dedication, did you take like some things for granted at a certain point? Did this affect your career? Um, if I'm gonna answer it honestly, I'm gonna answer it honestly, and um. I'm a, I'm a little, I was a little boy from Tucson, Arizona. No one even heard of Tucson, Arizona. Um, I got to the position that I'm at right now because of hard work and dedication. And that's why I have a following with me, even here in the States. Um, that's solid because they know what I stand for. There's no way that a guy that doesn't dunk the basketball, I'm not, like you said, I'm not tall. I'm not the fastest. I'm not dunking on people. For me to accomplish what I've accomplished in my career takes hard work. So for those that say, oh, he, he doesn't work hard, he doesn't have self-discipline. I got here for a reason. It is self-discipline. It is hard work. Otherwise, I wouldn't even been a pro. I would have folded a long time ago if I didn't have self-discipline. I wouldn't have been a legend in college basketball. I'm a legend here in the States in college basketball. I did a lot of things in two years that a lot of people hasn't done in four years, and they still talk about it to this day. You understand? That's hard work. You just don't wake up and just do that. Even in this interview, Talking is like talking to people who think they're my parents. There's not another player that you would talk to where they say, oh, well, he went out and went to dinner last night and had a glass and had a bottle of wine on a date. He's not disciplined, but he went to the game and had 40 points and won the game. Get out of my business. What are, what's, you guys are not my father. You're not my mother. It doesn't affect my game. I'm giving you the same thing. Consistent, consistent night in and night out. I do what I do night in, night out for years. That's why I'm a legend. Let's not play games. You know, don't worry about what I do the night before the game. It's not your business. I'm a grown man with children. What are are you doing? Worry about yourself. As long as I get out here and give what you guys paid me to do. Win the game and put up. I was getting bonuses for having 30-point games. Who wouldn't try to go have 30 points? You giving me $1,500 to have 30 points and a win? I'm going to go do that. That's my job to make money, right? So right. like when I when I when I hear this stuff, it, it doesn't bother me because it's just like the ex-girlfriend that's just talking in your ear, it's just retarded to me. You know what I'm saying? Like especially from Lebanese people. I'm like, "Dude, you guys party all week. What are we talking about? You guys sell our mazel on the side of the street. 
You guys got a restaurant and a bar every corner. Fish and whiskey. What are we talking about? So how are you guys going to tell me that I'm living undisciplinary when I'm winning championships and breaking records? A guy who's undisciplined can't go score 75 points in a game. What happened to these other disciplined guys? Why haven't they done that? Why are they still trying to, why do I still have records out here that aren't even being touched by disciplined men? It's not about I'm just gifted from God. I put in the work and God blesses me with accomplishments because you can't hide truth. And no matter how much they try to ignore, no matter how much they try to talk on me, the truth always is there and people know. Terrell, uh, how's your relationship with Coach Fuad? Are you still, are you still in contact with him? And how, how was the experience in Lebanon with Coach Fuad? He's a great man. He's a great man. Um, he, he, he was like a big brother to me, especially being a young man. That's another thing. You know, people talking about this and that. I was a young man who was married, living in a whole different country by myself and, and putting on for your, for, your, for your people. You know, my son was born there. I lived there. You know what I'm saying? So um, I, had a, I have a real good relationship with your country and with your people. I love the um, I love your food <laughs> and I love the Mediterranean Sea, man. And, and Coach Fo, I knew that about me. He knows that I like to live life. You know what I'm saying? What makes me the way that I am on the court is because I like to enjoy the small things in life that many people do not like to think about. You know, I'm a type of dude that will sit outside for eight hours before a game on the beach with my with my toes in the water. You know what I'm saying? I'm the dude that after the game, we going dancing, you know, and that rubs people the wrong way sometimes because they look at you like, yo, I'm doing all this work. And you're you're killing and you you seem like you don't care. You make it look easy. Like you said, people don't like that, especially when their wives are watching the games, especially when their fans are watching the games. A lot of times I got talked about because people were just jealous. How can you like a guy who's ne who's untouchable? I'm not I'm not worried about the outside noise. I'm in my own world. Did you face jealousy from your own team? I think every player faces jealousy with their own team and with their own spouses. No, I'm playing. <laughs> nah. Yes. Um, I've been in situations in Lebanon where um, I've invited guys to my house to have my wife cook for them and they never showed up. And then they go talk about me in interviews that I was the worst teammate ever, that they ever played with. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a there's a lot that goes into it. You gotta you can't forget that professional athletes. This is one of the most corrupt industries. Sports. I was gonna <laughs> ask you about corruption, by the way. Oh you my it god! Up. <laughs> it is one of the most corrupt industries ever, and especially if it's easy for you to be a scapegoat. A lot of the times, coaches and GMs they use. I'm going to say they, they'll use me as a scapegoat if something doesn't go their way. You know, if you're sitting in a room with me and I make you feel inadequate or I make you feel less than, and then you go to your people and they talk about me, you're going to feel some resentment. You're going to say, hey, I don't like this guy because he's undisciplinary. He came to practice drunk. I'm like, dude, there's times where I came to practice hungover. The whole team was hungover, including the coach. It's Lebanon. But then somehow it's out there like, oh, Terrell was drunk at practice today. Yeah, I was drunk at practice today, busting your ass. <laughs> oh, he drinks too much. Dropping 70 on you. Maybe if you're worried about yourself. What about the corruption inside the Lebanese League? <laughs> you trying to get me in trouble now. No, nah, no, no, man, no. I, I, I'll say it like this because I don't, I don't care. Um, truth is truth, man. I've been, I've been in situations, man, where I watch the games get thrown. You know, and the coach made a hefty amount of money. You know what I'm saying? For us losing games. I've I, I've been in situations where um, I've seen administrations come to save a team, but actually they were stealing from the team. And once the money was dry, they left. And I had to just sit there and take it because I can't say anything. And when I did say something about it, it's easy for them to go talk about me. They just go say he did this and he did that. People tell love it. that. They eat can that. You us, can you tell us about the year when you had D-Bulls and Ibekwe with you? 
Oh man, uh, that was a great season. And honestly, we should have won that championship. That game was thrown for money. Mm -hmm. They only have more money, and they were actually paying play uh, people that played for Suggest and people who were a part of the organization. They were paying them, and um, yeah, uh, that's all I'll say about that. I don't want to get too deep in that. But everything is not always what it seems, you know. And there's a lot of corruption. The same guys that people think are good guys are a lot of times not good. And the guys who people think aren't good, a lot of times they are good. You know, we live in an upside down world and I think people know that. Did some people try to make money off of you in Lebanon? Uh, Yeah, people try to make money off me off everywhere, especially when I was younger, not too much now. But when I was younger, yeah, you know, um, a lot of bad deals where they act like they didn't have money and the extra money was going in their pocket. And I, I, I had, a, I had when I played for Suggest, um, I had a deal in China for $350,000. And that was a good amount of money for me at the time, especially being newly married and having a son. Um, and I had a, the staff from Suggest would not release me. And they owed in Suggest at the time owed me $25,000. And they told me that they wouldn't send me the money unless I signed another contract and play with them for another year. You know, this happened in like 2016. Or 2016, 2015, I believe. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be like 2016, 2017, something like that. Yeah. The last season you played in Lebanon? It might have been the last season. I can't remember. I played a lot of places, bro. <laughs> you know, real talk, you know. Terrell, uh, let's go a bit technical. Uh, Terrell, the point guard, or Terrell, the shooting guard? Um, Terrell, the combo guard. I can bring the ball up and do what you need, but I'm more efficient coming off the ball. I think that's pretty um, understandable. You know what I'm saying? You, get, you know, I don't really think so much of it. When I when I when I sign the teams, they normally have a point guard who's who's just coming down and, and hit me off them picks. <laughs> you know, Terrell, you changed your game in Lebanon, kind of. Uh, whenever you first came, uh, you had. Uh, a skinny body, you were taking your shots, uh, your penetrations were minimal. Throughout the years, you put on some muscle mass, some muscle, uh, it, was, it was transformation. Uh, we saw you attacking the basket, we saw you getting fouls, we saw you being aggressive. That, did that level up your game at one point of your career? And well, how, how did you take that decision? Yeah, I mean, everything that I do isn't really thought about, right? It's, it's, it's a lot of genetics too, like, I was a child when I came to Lebanon. You know what I'm saying? I was like 22, 23. I just got back from Euro League. I was in Europe for like two and a half years. I played everywhere. Russia, VTB, all that. And um, when I came to Lebanon, I was really just a child, bro. <laughs> I played there, what, for like five, six years, five years, on and off. And um, I just <laughs> – it was becoming a man, dog. It was just body, it was body weight, nigga. For real, for real. You know, just being a man. You know, I ain't a kid no more. You know what I mean? So, and and my mentality is, I don't see. I always went to the basket, always. Even in college, if you you know, if you knew anything about my my college years or anything, my my beginning of pro years, I always I always go to the basket, hit big man in, in the chest, finish. You know, I've been doing that since I was real little. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. I guess you guys just got to see it more. But honestly. I went back to Europe when I came back to Lebanon. So I was in Turkey for like two years. I played in the top league over there. And then Fowa bought me out. And I came back to Lebanon and I was more big because in, in Europe, you got to, they don't call fouls for you too much. You really got to like, you know? You got to you gotta take the foul. Yeah, it depends on where you play in Europe. So like Greece, ooh, Greece, yeah. I'm I'm the youngest, you know, to, to ever put 32 points on Olympiacos. I only missed two shots. I shot 80% from the field. They offer me a deal right there. Them and Pantianakos, boom, offer me a deal right there. So, like, I got records everywhere. So, like, anyway, Greece um, was physical. I had to get big for that. In in Turkey, and um, and those are the only places in Europe that I believe was, like, physical. Everything else was real soft. Tara, how do you compare the Lebanese league to the leagues you played in Europe? Um, I like the Lebanese league because it's more of, like, pickup ball. That's why I was able to get off like that, dropping 35 points for a full season. And yeah, that's just that's just a brother that's going out there having fun, hooping. You know, there's a difference. See, I'm a hooper. 
there's a difference between professional basketball players, basketball players, and hoopers. I'm just a hooper, bro. We supposed to put this ball in the hoop, and we supposed to hoop. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's and that's just what Lebanon let me do. Coach Fowler yeah. was was great letting me hoop. He like, we gotta win this game. We gotta win by ten points. Go do what you do. Bet. So I think for me out. that we're less, <laughs> we're far less technical than Europe. Huh? We're far less technical. Yeah, Europe. Europe. Europe was a was a mind game, and they never let me rest. You know, when I was in France. Um, they they had me studying film all day. I couldn't I couldn't do it. I left Europe. That's why I came to Lebanon. You know, I was in I was in a deal with Varese in Italy. You know, and I got out of that. You know, came to Lebanon where the sun is shining. <laughs> but that, we saw a lot of imports uh, coming to Lebanon, then getting big contracts in the NBA, like Hassan Whiteside, like we are brief this year with Portland. Yeah. So. The league has exposure, if you want to talk yeah. about it. And uh, the level is not really that bad. Man, I don't take credit for a lot of things, but I like to think that I had a lot to do with that. You know, when I came to Lebanon, I'm not going to say that it was a bad league, but they didn't have um, guards that were like me. And once I came with Suggest and we played Reality, I have 40, and we won in that derby, Reality went and got Jamar Young. After they got Jamar Young, then all the other teams start getting guards that can score, guards that can go. You know what I mean? Until this day, everybody that they get are guards that are similar to me. You know what I mean? And that's real. They do that everywhere I go. So same thing with Egypt. When I got there, they didn't have any guards that was like me. You know what I'm saying? Right when I left, then they go get Walter Hodge. Then they go get Two Holloway. Then they go get, you know, Kevin Galloway. Guys that play similar to me or guards that are similar to I. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, with all due respect towards everybody, I, I I kept a lot of these leagues afloat when they weren't top at that time. Terrell, we also saw some imports uh, after their NBA career, after the EuroLeague career, coming to Lebanon, ending their careers in Lebanon. What's your take on that? Is it the right thing to do at the end of your career? So you say, and we saw many, many, many imports, just like Jeremy Fargo. And he was young, by the way, whenever he came to Lebanon. He finished, he went back to the States, he signed a 10-day contract with the Golden State Warriors after his Lebanese experience. We saw J.J. Hickson, we saw many, many, many players coming from the NBA and not succeeding in the league. Yeah, um, there's levels to this. And, and sometimes players who played in the league, and not just played in the league, you got to remember, the league is different now. Like, when, I, when we talk about the NBA now, it's not how it used to be. The, the league used to be, like, real. It's real easy for people to get in now. No disrespect to anyone who gets in there. Um, but it's more open now. But guys like Jeremy Pargo, J.J. Hickson, guys that played in the real NBA, early 2000s, like, um, I'm pretty sure they came to Lebanon to get a check. I don't think that they really gave a care. I don't, I don't think they care. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's just being a, a, a professional athlete that know how we talk behind closed doors. They'd be like, no, I'm just going over there and get a check. You know? Dwight Howard's been linked to three teams in Lebanon this year. Yeah. Beirut, uh, Hekme, and uh, Hamantum. Three of yeah. these, all of these teams are in negotiations with Dwight. Do you think that the, the result would be the same? He's just going to come for the check? I don't know. and I can't. I would be a fool to speak on that because I don't know D. Howard like that. You know, I never met him. You know, Jay Park was my, my dog. You know what I'm saying? I know Jay Park, you know what I mean? And we played each other in Italy, and we went at it, too. That's my dog. And I know how he think, you know, so I'm able to speak on that. Like, you know, some guys come for the check. D. Howard, I don't know his situation, bro. Maybe he's just playing for the love of the game, and he might come and just kill that shit. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. But I do know that, you know, what's important to some people isn't important to a lot of people sometimes. You know, it might be important to me. It don't mean it's important to you. You know what I'm saying? Do you think that some Lebanese players would have made it to the NBA like Fadi? Yeah, man, that's a great question, my brother. <laughs> um, the only players that I played in the Middle East, and this is to be no disrespect to anyone else, that were like Middle Eastern or African, um, Ismael from Egypt and um, and Fadi 
from Lebanon. When I play Smile's fast, Lebanese now, by the way. Who is? Smile from Egypt. He's Lebanese now. He got the That's Lebanese wild. a few years back. That's wild. He's God bless him, man. Playing as a local in Riyadi. He's still playing, by the way, at the age of 47, 48, something like that. God bless him, man. Take care of his body, man, and all he's that. Still, he's still a game changer, man. He's still oh, a game changer. Oh, I, mean, I, don't think, I don't think you can beat Riyadi as long as he's with them. He's a good player, man. And he, he's a real pro. So, like, that's to answer your question, that's what I'm going with. I'm saying Fatty and Ismail. You know what I mean? The, those are the ones that I was like, okay. And, and Honest, Honest Muhammad that played for uh, Zamalek with me. You know, I was like, you, you belong in the league. You know what I'm saying? But... I don't really I haven't really played anybody in the Middle East or anything where I was like, oh, this this dude tough and he need to be in the league. Nah. Terrell, uh Dubai tournament. You went with six imports, let's suggest. And it was maybe the worst disappointment the team has ever faced at any competition. The expectations were very high. We're going with six imports. You had Ali Mazhir, you had Nadim, you have at their at their prime. Nadim at his prime, Ali Mizhi was still developing. Uh, you, you lost, surprisingly. Why? What happened? Um, I mean, if you ask me, honestly, you got you just got to take accountability for that, just being an athlete. Like, oh, yeah, we shouldn't have lost. Um, but on top of that, like, not to make excuses for anything, but coaching and administration are never under attack. If you know the game of basketball, you can't just bring six talented men together and say, go win. It doesn't work that way when you're playing against guys who've been together for years and know and have a bond, have a brothership, chemistry together. You understand? It doesn't work that way. Now, if we would have came together a month before Dubai and played together, we would have won that easy. But we were still figuring each other out. Well, we played like three games together. We We didn't even practice together. We practiced probably like, Two hours the day before we played. Best thing I could tell you, I know how how basketball's played. I know how to win. Like that doesn't work. And the team that we lost to was an African team that had been together for over thirteen years. To that, how close were you to Julian? Um, not too close. We were just good teammates. Um, I respected yeah. him. Why you did know you? What I'm he was he was um he was the best big man I played with in my career and um I played with a lot a lot of good big men you know what I'm saying he's the best yeah why did he leave uh financials money issues promises that weren't kept same reason why we all left <laughs> but wasn't it like disappointing to leave at the middle of the season leaving good guys hanging? I'm going to be honest with you, um, as the players, like the American players, us, care? You don't care. Nah, they didn't pay you. I would leave too. This ain't my country. You know what I'm saying? I got to go back home. If 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 I'm not getting paid, bro, I can't just be playing for, for my heart. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, when I go home, I got bills I got to pay. I think you guys ain't blessing me from your heart. I left my family to come here and play for y'all. You're not gonna pay me and just call me her baby and then pretty much tell me kick rocks. I gotta go home. I got I got bills I can't pay now. Were it's you ever contacted for the Lebanese national team? It's, it's bigger than basketball, definitely. Yeah, I was offered to play on the Moroccan national team. I was offered to play in the Lebanese national team. It was just talks, though. No, nothing. It was, it, it, it was just talks. You know, like oh, Stone's gonna play the national team. You know, same in Morocco. It was like Stone gonna play the national team. Um, no, I haven't, no, no, nothing, no national team, no. Today, let's take some questions with the fans. Fans went crazy whenever you posted the poster. Uh, let's start. Okay, Muhammad asks you, can we see him playing in Lebanon again? Uh, of course, if the money's right, you know you can't you can't pay a dude forty thousand dollars and another dude twenty five thousand dollars and then come to me and try to give me five. That's disrespectful. I'd rather stay here. You know what I'm saying? I'm happy here. I stay home. 
Rakan asks you, what do you say to those who say you are out of shape and that your level declined a lot, a.k.a. one of the coaches you played with before? Love you, and thank you for all the memories and the views. Well, first of all, tell them that I love them, and I appreciate them for asking me these questions and even caring to ask these questions. You know what I'm saying? It's all love on my end. You know, <clears throat> like I said, man, it, I can't say anything to that. I just let that be. I can't worry about that. I just let my game speak for itself. You know, like I said, I have a lot of people who said when I left Lebanon, my game declined. I won championships. I broke records after I left Lebanon. I just got back from the BAL. I averaged 30 points a game. My Nothing has stopped. And I'm out here killing these young cats that play for the U of A and ASU every, every other weekend. You know what I'm saying? The same guys playing in this national tournament right now, kicking their ass over here. You know what I'm saying? And they're younger. You know, I don't really pay attention to that. You know, the coaches say what they have to say to save their behinds. So that, I want to ask you a question. How did Lebanon and the experience in Lebanon help you grow as a person off the court? Um, I learned a lot of do's and don'ts. I learned that you can't trust people. You know, there's times where I would get invited to a restaurant, go sit at the restaurant, you know, have wine and fish. And then when I leave the restaurant, you know, I get messages of people saying, oh, he's been out drinking all night. I'm like, yo, I was doing the same thing you guys were doing with your family on this Saturday night. The only difference is I have a game tomorrow where you guys could watch me play and I'm going to put a show on for you. So the thing is, basketball is easy when you've done it for so long. I've, I've worked so hard. It's just easy. It's just about reading the game, you know, so like I don't. I can't pay attention to any negativity that's spoken about me because I have more love that's given. Rita asks you, how did his experience playing for Sajets influence his basketball career overall? And how does his presence on social media help maintain the bond between you and the Sajets fans over the years? Yeah, um, I've only kept my uh, Instagram to keep in, in contact with my fans and the people because... Like, I feel like you guys are family. You know what I'm saying? I live in the people. And it's not just Lebanese people. It's the people around the world that I've touched. You know, Venezuela, they still write me. China still writes me. Africa writes me every day. Um, Lebanese, Lebanon writes me. You guys keep me going. You know, there's times where I would put my head down. I'm a human being. Because there's times that I've been not, I don't, I don't excuse my language. There's times that I've been truly and honestly fucked over and lied about. And there's no other way for me to, to get through it other than understanding my faith walk and understanding that Jesus went through it too. Understanding that if God is for me, no one could be against me. Understanding that no matter what they say about me, my records still stand. I still live in the people. You know, you can't talk about a guy who's, who's completely and utterly the best. Honestly, I believe that in Lebanon, if you want to shine, if you want your name to shine, if you want to be backed up, you either have to play for Riyadh or for Hikmah. We saw many, many, many people, many imports. Even this year, there's Christoph Khalil playing for Mayruba. He's averaging a double-double and he's playing amazing games. No one's talking about him just because there's no fan base. So the fan base is very, very important for the player, for his name to glow out there. Yeah, and, and that's, pretty, that's everywhere. That's just sports, man. You play for the Lakers or the Celtics, you're going to get more, you know, PR than a guy who plays for the Detroit Pistons. You know what I mean? So, like, uh, that's just how it is, bro. You know? Samir asks you, are you open to coming back to Sajas? I appreciate all the, the offers to come back, but they don't make the decisions. The fans don't. You know, it's the administration. I'll only come back if I'm treated fairly. You know, Sajas owes me a lot of money that I know I would never touch. but if you can compensate me and respect me enough to offer me a deal that's normal, then I'll come back. There's no question about it. Anthony asks you, what's your best memory with Sajas? <laughs> I have too many memories for one to be the best, man. Um, if I had to pick one out, it would be probably uh, when my son was born. And um, my wife at the time came in with my son. And everybody bowed down and was saying, Stoglin, Stoglin, when my son came in, that touched my heart, man. It made me feel one with the people, you know. It, so when you're a professional athlete, especially a black American athlete, man, um, you're a dime a dozen. Like, 
I can't name how many guards have came out of Lebanon, but to be remembered and to live in the people's heart, even if they're talking bad or good, that, that that's, that's something. That's what it is. Because when I die, man, I, I know that I'm established on this earth. I wasn't just a basketball player. I was a guy that came with controversy. I was a guy that stood for something. I was a guy that stood for Christ, and I was just solid. I'm witty. Terrell Kevin asks you, is it true that you were drunk when you scored 74 points against Jean-Ville? A hundred percent true. I never denied that. A hundred percent true. And I wasn't drunk. I was hungover. You know what I'm saying? Um, I had a, I had about a week of studying Bruce Lee and um, in the word of God. And I appreciated the philosophies that Bruce Lee had. And um, the night before we played uh, Jean-Ville, I... Um, I went to a birthday party, a Lebanese birthday party, and I ended up being on the beach. You know what I'm saying? With my friends, you know, it was their birthday. And we we went to the beach that night and stayed there all the way to the next morning. And um, I just went and just have fun. You know what I'm saying? I went and just had fun. I guess it became legend that I was drunk or whatever. But I I was just in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a position in life where basketball was my therapy. It was my getaway, you know. I was learning what true betrayal was. Like I was hanging out with people who I found I was finding out wasn't really my friends. They just want to pick my brain. They want to know information about me, but they were like going behind my back and talking about me. I, I was dealing with a lot at that time. And so when they, when they rolled that ball out and said, look, this is a rivalry game. It's coach Foa versus Sarkis. It's a uh, suggest for Sean Bill Christian versus Christian. I was like, all right, let's hoop. You know what I'm saying? That's all it was. It's unfortunate, actually, that someone told you it's Christian versus Christian, honestly. That's what they were telling me. We're Christian and they're Christian. Let's see who, you know. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Let's go out here and do this then. Terrell, I think that's one of your guys, uh, Natural Neff. He asks you about the senior year in high school, the year you won. That's my brother. My brother Neff was Papa boy. Hey, um, another thing. Uh, state championship in high school went to state all four years won it my last year almost beat my bibby's record um he's asking me about it this dude named neff locked down the best defender of the other team and was one of the best teammates that i played with and i appreciate him for logging in right now and showing his love and respect for me i love you neff stay solid boy uh you, hey, hey he's a state champion too neff a state champ you know he's santa rita high school baby Terrell, uh, Edward asks you, do you think you can fit Sajas' team this year? All the love. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I don't really watch basketball, man. Uh, if I watch anything, it's old school games like Allen Iverson, Kobe, uh, Jerry Stackhouse, Stephon Marbury. I still watch those guys, man. Um, I haven't checked in to suggest. I haven't checked in on Africa. I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I don't know when the league starts. I don't know anything, bro. Jason asks you, we want, he, he doesn't ask you, he's asking from you, we want you to come to watch a game in Ghazir. Uh, hey, there's a few times that I, I came to Lebanon and you guys had games and I was going to go, but I, I just want to keep the peace. I don't want to start any rumors, like, you know, and, but I'm going to pop in. I might be back this summer just to visit. I always come back. I come back every year to visit. Every year. I think that's one of your own also. God's very own grooming. I don't know if it's, it's someone or some of your friends. How many more years does Terrell have left in his prime? <laughs> man, I'm going to be honest with you, man. Um, I'm getting tired of the business side of basketball. I love the game, but the business side and just dealing with, you know, the stuff that I deal with, you know, even with the J. Cole stuff that I went through in Africa, you know, it was on ESPN and all that stuff. It's, it's frustrating. I give myself a good four more years left before I hang it up. You four know, what I'm I still got four years left. I'm more mature. I feel good. I'm still working out. I, I feel good. Honestly, I feel like I'm at my best right now because I'm more at peace than I ever was. Nothing you know? to worry about except basketball. Yes, everything outside of basketball is in place right now. And I have nothing to focus on instead of things that I want to focus on. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for this episode. Good luck in your career. We wish you all the best. We hope to see you one day back in Lebanon. My brother, uh, I appreciate the interview, man. I appreciate the love and respect, man. All love. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. Thanks, man. Take care.
Peace.